Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and let me give you a very warm welcome to this inspiring global right to, refer, uh, right to repair forum. I'm glad to remind you that today's initiative is a part of a series of events organized by Autopromotech and dedicated to international automotive aftermarket. Right to Repair campaign is an utmost important communication tool that independent aftermarket at a worldwide level uses to promote and maintain a level playing field in motor vehicle repair industry by supporting, for example, free access to technical information, to spare parts, to multi-brand diagnostic tool and data equipment, and so on. With the increasing of digitalization in cars, the Right to Repair campaign is now entering into a new dimension where the access to onboard data and vehicle functions is really necessary to guarantee competition and innovation in digital product and services. The hearings of above reasoning frame the context of our today's discussion where special tenants will be free competition and access to, to data. Both are major issues for automotive aftermarket that they are so strongly intertwined, not least they are a key issue for industry globally to the extent they will shape its future. Having said that, the beef of agenda is pretty much dense, so I, I would like to move along in introducing our distinguished panelists that I have the great honor and the great pleasure to welcome on stage and to introduce. So, at my left side, I would like to introduce to you Miss Silvia Gotzen, Chief Executive Officer of FIGEFA, the European Federation of Independent Distribution Aftermarket. Then, I would like to introduce to you the IGEA, the European Garage Equipment Association Vice President, Mr. Frank Bojan. Then, it's a pleasure to have here from the United States the Vice Senior President of Autocare Association, Mr. Aaron Lowe. And then, it's always a pleasure to have here from Australia the Australian Aftermarket Automotive Aftermarket Association, Mr. Stuart Charity. So, let's start with the discussion, and I would like to address my first question to, to Silvia. Silvia, in these times, the independent aftermarket is facing several challenges that will affect the future of independent operators. One of them, really, really important, is the motor vehicle block exemptions regulation renewal process. FIGEFA, as you know very well, has always been at the forefront of this issue and some news has started to circulate since the beginning of this year. So, could you explain us uh, the European Commission's last January decisions uh, and uh, FIGEFA activities, achievements and next steps? The floor is yours. Yeah, many thanks, Pia Giorgio, and um, also from my side, first of all, a big, a big thank you to the organizers. And it's a true pleasure to see you here in person after so many years of uh, the corona period. So uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here today with you as a first introduction. Basically, that we can be here at Autopromotech and that we can operate is part of the invisible, very often invisible part of our work, which is indeed looking at and working for you, creating framework conditions for our automotive aftermarket. We should not take it for granted so that we can all operate and do business is inter alia due to the fact that there is a mother regulation, a regulation in Brussels which allows us to operate so freely. And that is part of our work of Adira, of FIGEFA. Indeed, as Pierre Giorgio also said, we have one important regulation in Brussels, that's the general competition law regulation for the automotive aftermarket sector, the block exemption regulation sector, which unfortunately will just expire next year, mid next year. And the commission 
initially wanted to drop it because they are not because they don't appreciate our sector, but this legal instrument is something which they, these exemptions to competition legislation, they don't like any longer. The automotive sector is one of the last sectors who has this exemption. So for, for quite legalistic reasons, they initially wanted to drop it. And thanks to your feedback, thanks to our input, we were able to give to the European Commission, they now decided in January to maintain this piece of legislation. That's good news. So indeed, that is why the associations here were, are important to convey the message to the European legislator, Commissioner Vestager. But we don't want only to remain at the status quo because this piece of legislation is 10 years old. On the contrary, we would like to modernize and update it because we received quite some complaints from you, from the market. For example, what happened due to technical progress, due to digitalization, the block exemption regulation looks indeed at situations where car manufacturers frustrate competition, where they, where they yeah, frustrate competition and hamper us as independent operators. And we got feedback from the market, for example, um, that car manufacturers use the new technologies indeed to hamper our access to the vehicle, hamper our access to data, or don't give the repair and maintenance information which we should get. As an example, spare parts are now more and more coded. So the coding is there, an RFID code or a um, QR code, for example, which as such is not a bad thing in itself. But the code is used or is not given by car manufacturers to us as independent parts wholesalers, independent uh, parts producers or even the tier one. And that means the car then doesn't recognize any longer a spare parts coming from the independent market. I think we all know the situation that our damn printer doesn't work any longer when we have uh, non-original cartridges. So here we are, just as one example. Um, we have now also, and then is the, that is the one of the last examples, we can go into these details a little bit later, but more and more parts in the market are made captive. We are not artificially or sometimes due to certain property rights which are used or even abused. Yeah? For example, the three-dimensional insertion of logos of car manufacturers, for example, in headlamps. Um, so, the increasing captivity of parts, and we don't get the parts any longer in the independent aftermarket is an issue, so we are not any longer as wholesalers then, or we, we are threatened not to be any longer a one-stop shop for our customers, big problem. Um, we have a lot of problems received from the market that it is increasingly difficult to unequivocally identify a vehicle, we don't get the build or configuration data of the vehicle, and then the repairers don't know, for example, if an advanced driver assistance system is built in the vehicle, and or, dur excuse me, or in, only during the repair they notice, and the calibration is not done, for example. So, just a few examples where we would like, and we have already alerted the Commission, that just renewing this piece of legislation is a first step, but this is not enough. So these are just a few first initial um, considerations of the variety, and in a few minutes certainly more, but of the variety of issues which, uh, which are on our table in Brussels, but thanks to you, from, thanks to your feedback from the market. Thank you, thank you, Silvia, for your very insightful perspective, and this gives me the possibility to address my second question to, to Frank. Frank, another major challenge, which is crucial for ensuring free competition in automotive aftermarket, is the access to in-vehicle data. IGEA, together with FIGEFA and other five European associations, is an active member of AFCAR, the Alliance for Freedom for Car Repair in Europe. AFCAR aims, to promo aims at promoting uh, uh, access to technical information, more generally to all features that uh, allows multi-brand independent operators to perform uh, repair and maintenance uh, services. Can you explain us 
uh, what we are talking about and what the independent associations want to achieve at a regulatory process and level. Yes, thank you. Let me explain it with a practical example. First of all, grazie for having me here. So let's start with, with the daily business uh, in the workshop. Not what we are doing in the, in the Brussels office and, and what is going on there. They have their own slang and you don't understand this. But this is important because these are the lawmaking, okay? What Sylvia and we are doing in Brussels. Uh, but practically in the workshop all over Europe, uh, it's a very, let's start with the most simple example. You just go to a regular filter service with a vehicle. You have to change from time to time your filters. It's an easy job to do. Uh, the workshop is checking also the rest of the car, if it's okay, if it's something to repair or to maintain. So it's quite a, a, a job you expect to maintain your mobility, which is very important. And in the end of the service, the owner of the workshop tells you he may not reset the service counter. Unfortunately, he cannot reset the service counter. He shows you the invoice, he apologizes, 10,000 arms, scusi, scusi, but I cannot reset the service counter. So every time you turn off your vehicle, then you hear the ping, your service should have been done two weeks ago. And he is simply not in a position to, sit, to set that back. So very simple, but this is only nerve wracking. Okay, he can still do the service, and it's nerve-wracking for the customer. Maybe the customer says, oh, I go to the OEM because this is really nerve-wracking. Every morning, your service has to be done in three weeks ago, and so on. Uh, when we go a little bit deeper, let's say your parking system is not working anymore, and it says there's an error somewhere. I'm not an expert, I'm just a driver. So I go to the workshop, and maybe the workshop can read the error counter, then he sees ah, one of the parking sensors seems to have a shutter or whatever. Okay, let, let's have a check. So he's going on the lift, on the check, and it's just, ah, just the contact is loose, no big thing. Okay, so he fixed that very easily, and uh, the car owner is happy. No big repair, no big costs nearby my workshop, just five miles away from home. Super great, I can go to the office. But the workshop owner says, Scusi, I cannot set back the error. And as long as I cannot set back the error in the, in the vehicle, uh, the parking system won't work. I'm not able, even when I fixed your car for good cost, for almost no cost, I'm not able to provide you the service that I set back this error, and so on. And it re gets really bad when you have to exchange the sensor, as Sylvia said, because the sensor is coded, so even when you have a good spare part, which is exactly the same spare part like the original spare part, with the same quality, you have no chance. The workshop owner says, scusi. I have no idea, I have no possibility that I uh, uh, adopt the sensor into the system of the vehicle. So as you see, the workshop owner says a lot of scusi and all that, which are most common service, as we all know as a car owner. And then he might say, the workshop owner, what is my future? What, what, is, what, can, what is left over for me? Which kind of business is left over for me as a service uh, uh, when we do not get this access to the data within the vehicle? And this is, I think, a very good uh, example that I've told you. Then you ask yourself, I can stop my business and uh, uh, go home and finish and quit. Thank you. Frank, I'm, I'm grateful to Silvia and, and Frank because I think they gave us a clear understanding of what is happening in Europe now regarding two very topical issues for the automotive aftermarket. Now, let's make a pitch across the ocean and we turn our attention to the United States. As we remain... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As we remain on, on this subject, 
we have indeed a great opportunity to talk uh, with those working on behalf of the entire independent aftermarket chain in North America. So, Aaron, in your opinion, what is the level of competition between authorized operators and independent operators in the United States today? Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me uh, to Italy to do this. It's certainly not the worst place I've had to visit in my life. It's just so beautiful. Um, and always pleased to be here to talk about um, what's going on in the United States. But the issues that are happening in our industry right now in the United States are this very similar to the issues that are going on in Europe, in Australia, and all over the world. We're truly a, glo a global industry. And the good thing is now that the aftermarkets in the United States and all over the world are sharing information more and more and the, the level of cooperation between countries and aftermarket groups is the most I've ever seen. Um, and I think it, it can only benefit the industry to have such a strong independent voice globally and not just within countries because the issues we're facing in the United States are the same issues that Sylvia uh, has also talked about in, in, uh, in Europe. And, um, in the United States right now, uh, we, we fought really hard for the last several years to get right to repair passed, and we did back in 2012. Similar to the block exemption, it required the same information tools, software that were made available to the authorized dealer had to be made available at a reasonable price to the independent aftermarket. But what's happened since then, and, th th and that has um, been a very successful effort in that we are have access to a lot more data, to software that we didn't have before. But technology is advancing really fast, and what agreements were in the past are not necessarily working now. We're now seeing car companies put firewalls around their onboard diagnostic systems. So what used to be a non-proprietary um, gateway to a system that's going away to some extent because of these gateways. They're proprietary. Not that they're wrong, that they need to protect their systems for cybersecurity, but having a um, proprietary access means that every tool manufacturer, every shop will have to have a different way of getting into each vehicle. And the benefits of having that open access to an onboard diagnostic system that our industry and industries around the world have is going away. The other issue is wireless access to data. Um, right now, the only requirement in the United States is that the data from the OBD system for emissions-related functions only must be made available through the OBD port. Everything else can come through uh, wireless access. So we are concerned about where this is going, and ultimately, the manufacturers could become the gatekeeper for the vehicle. Right now, the consumer makes decisions on where they go to get their car repaired based on choice. That could disappear in the not too distant future as the car companies are able to control more and more of what comes out of that vehicle. So we fought and, and obtained passage in the state of Massachusetts of a ballot initiative in 2020 um, by a 75 to 25% margin. This is the same election where President Biden was elected. We also got a, um, this, this data access provision included as part in Massachusetts. And what it said is um, the car owner can direct data from their vehicle to, for repair and diagnostics to whomever they want. In other words, directly from the vehicle to an independent shop if they so choose. And it also requires that if they want to put a firewall on their vehicle system, they have to do it in a standardized way across all makes and models. Unfortunately, soon after that ballot initiative was overwhelmingly passed by, um, by the uh, citizens of Massachusetts, um, and after the car manufacturers fought it, spending about $25 million, I'm not sure what that would be in euros, but it's a lot of money in any country, they lost, but they went to court, and they filed a legal action in federal court, and that's right now, um, the judge in that case has delayed that five times. So we don't know where that's gonna go ultimately or how that's gonna be decided, but it will become appealable after that, so it's at least a year away. But we're already looking at trying to find implement implementation to show that data can cyber securely be accessible directly from a vehicle to an independent shop, both wired and wirelessly. Um, we're gonna be demonstrating that in the US in the very, very near future because ultimately that is the future for the industry. If we can't have, if our customers can't control where their vehicles are repaired, 
ultimately, um, the uh, competition in our country, will, and I think in Europe and, and around the world, will disappear. So I think this is an important battle for the long-term health and, and welfare of our industry. And the, you know, we're, we're, our industry has done very well during COVID from a financial point of view, but I think we're all watching over the next several years as new technology continues to change that, that dimension within the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron, for your very interesting consideration. And now we make another little pitch across the ocean and we arrive in uh, Australia. Stuart, if I don't wrong, as on 1st July this year, a new legislation will come into force in your country, new legislation that is of paramount importance for the implementation of uh, free competition in uh, car repair and maintenance services. So, can you tell us uh, what this is all about and what role your association played in the regulatory process and uh, generally in defending the interest of uh, uh, Australian independent aftermarket? Thank you and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to come here and, and, and talk to you all. Um, we do have some very, very good news to, uh, to share with you. Uh, as Petra Giorgio said, uh, um, the Australian Parliament um, last year uh, passed legislation uh, through that requires that, that all car manufacturers operating in Australia share all service and repair information under fair and reasonable commercial terms. This is the culmination of a 12-year battle by our industry to, uh, uh, to achieve this outcome and, and it comes into effect on, on the 1st of July. Um, the, the test of what information is, is going to be shared with, with independent uh, operators is uh, uh, it will be that if, if the OEM shares that information uh, with their authorised dealership networks, uh, then they need to provide it to independent operators in the same form, format and time frame. So if it's uh, immediate uh, transfer of data uh, to, to uh, dealerships, then, then independent operators get that uh, immediate data. Um, there's big, big penalties for, for non-compliance. Um, $10 million uh, per car company, uh, per breach. Uh, that's the maximum fine. Uh, and our competition regulator has a, has a team set up just to do compliance and enforcement activities. So uh, this is very, very significant legislation. In terms of coverage or restrictions, um, the only real restrictions are around security-related information. Um, that is still to be shared with independent operators, but it has to be done via a secure data release model. And we're actually working with the, the US, uh, the, the, the National Automotive Service Task Force, that, to license their secure data release model in Australia. The only other um, restriction is, is around safety of technicians. Uh, so if a technician is accessing information on an electric vehicle or a high voltage vehicle, um, they need to have undertaken some basic training to, to be able to safely uh, depower and, and, and work on the vehicle and then reinitialize the vehicle. Um, so other than that, there are no impediments uh, to the sharing of information uh, to the independent aftermarket. Um, I did want to just uh, take a minute to, to I, I guess, share with you um, how we were able to achieve this outcome. And I think there were two key aspects. Um, the first is the international precedent and support that we received um, was absolutely critical to, to getting this outcome. So um, Sylvia and her team uh, at FGFA and, and the block exemption regulation and, and uh, Bill Hanvey and, and Aaron at Auto Care Association uh, and the work that they did on, on the Massachusetts legislation and then the, 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 uh, the national agreement in the US we could not have done it without their support um, for two reasons. One is that we were able to point to our members of parliament and say, look, Australia is lagging the rest of the world uh, in access to repair and service data. Um, but also, car companies act in the same way in, in every single market that they operate. So we were able to get that, that forward advice on, on how the, what the, the car industry would say, how they would react, how they would try and uh, fight your efforts. So we already knew in advance what they were going to do, and that's a big advantage for us. I think the second thing um, that we were able to do in Australia, and Australia in, in population terms is a smaller country. I know, you know you've got far bigger populations and it's more difficult to do. But what we were able to do is, is mobilise our industry and involve them in our campaign. Uh, so we put the call out to, and literally hundreds of 
workshops around our country um, sent uh, emails to their, their, their local members of parliament and invited them into their workshop um, and explained to them what the issues, the, the issues that Frank was talking about, the, the, the issues that happen on a daily basis and the effect on their business and on their customers. Um, and in the end, we had uh, nearly three quarters of our me federal members of parliament had been to a workshop visit somewhere around the country. So when it came time for the law to go through, all sides of politics supported it. And in fact, lucky it did because we had an election in Australia last week and there was a change of government. But the in incoming government is actually even more supportive of, of um, right to repair uh, than the outgoing government. So um, we couldn't have done it without the, the support of all of you and, and, and our members. And, and I think there's some, um, from some learnings there in terms of this is a global industry, it's a global fight. And I think cooperation between our associations and our industries is how we tackle the challenges of the future, like telematics, like um, uh, cyber security uh, regulation and uh, autonomous vehicles. There's a whole lot of challenges coming down the line, but um, that's, that's the way that we do it, working together. Excellent, Stuart. Thank you for your very interesting perspective. Now, the reasoning made by our panelists lead us to a new topic which involves the point of view of car driver or the point of view of the car owner along with the access to the dashboard. Consequently, the possibility for the driver to choose freely services. So I would like to have an opinion about this topic from all of you. So the, the floor is open. Silvia, if you want, you may start first. Mm -hmm. Please. Yes, many thanks, Pier Giorgio. Yes, indeed. Um, in, with digitalization and the in-vehicle telematics systems now in connected cars, indeed the dashboard, the human-machine interface is now the new interface with our customer. And uh, this is uh, indeed uh, one of the biggest issues we are dealing with in Brussels. And um, of course, you are in business, you might think, oh my God, uh, what are they doing uh, in this esoteric Brussels microcosm? But indeed, I think we heard from colleagues that this is the invisible but very important existence of a baseline legislation which indeed helps us, or for the moment not completely, um, with access to in-vehicle data. And what you mentioned, Frank, is, I mean, resetting, recalibration. But what we are doing in Brussels is looking 10 years ahead. And this is negotiated now in Brussels. And that is why, of course, I often have the impression that we look a little bit esoteric. Uh, but on the other hand, your future is currently debated in Brussels. And I know we are always talking about data. When we talk about, at present, about data, we mean the in-vehicle sensor-generated data. So when the car is driving, when the connected car is driving, and this is indeed the game changer because the car manufacturers, uh, indeed, through the closed telematic systems, channel these in-vehicle live data to their own servers and we are kicked out. But this is the future. In the future, nobody wants any longer to have a breakdown, but we need to have the possibility for remote monitoring, remote diagnostics of the vehicle. And this will be the future. Hence, indeed, also the fight for our customer. Car manufacturers have now the first grip on our customer because they are in direct contract with, through the dashboard, as you said, through the human interface with our customer. And that is exactly why we are fighting so fiercely to also get a legislation on access to in-vehicle data and functions in Brussels as a new baseline legislation. Okay. Thank you. Frank? Thank you, Silvia. So, uh, as Silvia said, uh, we are creating the future for decades, maybe even, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> when we consider now the question about the dashboard, this is now a total different approach to a repair or maintain, yeah. because now we are talking about that I can reach the driver, and the driver is a consumer, and yeah. the dashboard is the money printing machine of the future. Yeah. It 
is so. Okay, not now, but in the future. And uh, uh, Silvia has to fight in Brussels with demands from the car makers, which say only the car maker decides which app is on my dashboard. I will check first how good the idea, perhaps I can use it by myself. Yeah, and this is, you see, this is totally stupid uh, because uh, uh, the free market is, is, is we, we, are, uh, uh, we benefit from, from innovation, from new cool ideas. So I have no idea which kit here in Bologna is a great idea for a dashboard app. And this is just a super idea and I like the app, but the car maker says, very cool idea, no way on my dashboard uh, uh, is mine. Okay? And this is of course not the way how the future should be as a consumer, in this case a car driver. That is why also the fight is so important also about the dashboard that we have free access to the dashboard, not on security or safety issues, but to reach the car driver. Yeah, thank you. I don't Frank's, compl Frank's completely right. The, the innovation, we, we've been saying in the US that access to data is going to <coughs> benefit consumers from convenience, from innovation that they'll be able to get because people will create um, better solutions for car owners from having that data. The issue that we're gonna to have to address as an industry is making sure that, that data is cyber secure and the personal data is protected. The car manufacturers are taking the position that only they can be the ones that protect data. They're the only ones that are the trusted people that can take care of that data. It's a, it's a ruse and we all know it's untrue, but that's where they're going and we need to, to we, the burden is on our industry to prove that from a cyber secure way we can get that data. We can help um, consumers have better solutions, but um, we're going to have to make sure we can show that it can be done properly. And, I, and in the U.S., the personal data, the privacy issue is still a huge issue. We don't have the privacy protections that you have in the EU legislation. The U.S. has some state legislation that's been around, but basically it's still uh, an issue we're still wrestling with in the U.S. So we're facing that issue every day when we go to talk to legislators about the aftermarket access to data, which is why we've kept it very focused on repair and diagnostic data and not talked as much about other data because the personal <laughs> data is, continues to get in the way of, uh, of us discussing that issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I agree with everything that uh, has been said. Um, uh, telematics and, and, and wireless uh, transfer of, of data and, uh, and uh, information is the next frontier of, of, of right to repair globally again. Um, I think I saw some stats that there's, uh, by, by 2025, there'll be 350 million uh, connected vehicles globally. So, um, and the only reason we don't know about this as a consumer as an issue is that uh, the vehicle manufacturers haven't switched that on, but they can flick the switch at any time, and, and, and they will do it. And um, Aaron is exactly right that um, uh, they, they're arguing, again, consistently around the world that, that, that they're the only um, organisations that, that can keep people's data safe. Now, we take the view from the aftermarket, you, you buy the car, you own the car, and any data that's generated by that car, you should know um, what is being generated and who it's being sent to, and you should be able to have uh, uh, choice over that. Um, but before we do that as an industry, we, we do have to make sure that we, we get the infrastructure in place to be able to uh, securely and safely uh, share that data. And from an Australian perspective, one of the features of our legislation, although we didn't get um, telematics in, in the legislation, basically if the, if the car is mobile, then, then um, the legislation at the moment doesn't cover it. But it has the ability for the Minister of the Day um, to change the rules, uh, to incorporate things like telematics uh, um, if the car companies are using that to frustrate the scheme. So we have the flexibility in our legislation to be able to adapt to it, but we just don't have the infrastructure in place at the moment to do it. But um, yeah, it's something that we're collectively we're going to have to address as an industry. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Then I, I believe that the next five years 
will be decisive for the future of the aftermarket generally, but in particular for the future of independent aftermarket. So, what are your expect expectations about this period? What are the opportunities we may wind up? And are there, in your view, any headwinds we should face and take on? I mean, what about in keeping competition free? And what if competition is not or will be not safeguarded in the automotive aftermarket? I would like to have a brief and conclusive comments from all of you. Mm -hmm. Silvia, <laughs> over with you first. Yes, <laughs> many things. As I said, it's not taken for granted and uh, indeed the stakes have never been so high. I've, I'm since a long time in this sector and uh, we have only issues on the table which are not any longer one or two dimensional but now three, four, five dimensional. Having said that, we are ready to fight for our rights and uh, we are here in very good company. But we need your support, definitely, and the support of the national associations who are very important in the European setting because only working in Brussels is not sufficient. Um, the Council of Ministers is there where the national associations must do their work. So I'm very pleased to have Adira here with us and uh, of course Aika and the other associations. So please support these associations and it's not just that I do a favor now to you because I'm here on the podium, but uh, that is how uh, the European decision making works. And um, yeah, we have two scenarios, either we succeed or we fail. Um, succeeding means indeed that we, our sector, which is a fantastic sector, can continue to compete, can continue to innovate. And on the other hand, if we fail, it will not be, it will not be that we are, we are, we will lose competitiveness, we will lose grounds, it will not be, we will not disappear from one day to another. But we have studies which will show that gradually we will lose market share, we will lose opportunities. And, um, and um, the point is always that our comp enterprises, our entrepreneurs are really, really, um, I'm, I'm very proud of this sector and of the individual companies here. And that is why we really, really need to have a framework so that everybody can flourish. And that is under threat for the moment. So let's really point it out. I will not give the impression that the job is done, the game is not already um, ended, but um, I would not now give here to the audience uh, the absolute reassurance, uh, yeah. don't worry, everything is fine. No, we have to fight for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. I have to, I have to agree with Sylvia and I have to add um, that I, I'm now 30 years almost in this kind of lawmaking, consultants and lobbying. And uh, indeed, on this issue, the car industry is playing very tough. And I have also to say that they never played in the last 30 years so tough like they do it on this issue. And all over the world for any reason, because we had always emission discussions and all this, and, but we sit on the table with the car industry, we discuss it and we are reasonable people, mostly engineers somehow, and they find a solution and then we find the lawmaking. But not in this case. They fight for the data rooms, they want to protect it, they want to, they want to exclude everybody, they want to have the absolute monopole and they spend a lot of effort on that. They put a lot of manpower in Brussels, only Volkswagen with 250 people on the payroll. Unbelievable. Only Volkswagen. So there's a BMW, there's a PSA group, there's whatever. Do you see, they try really to convince the lawmakers, but uh, we have a very excellent system in uh, Brussels. I would say it's very transparent. You find everything when you want to look for, it is there. Uh, other than we learned from the United States that you have a good law and with 25 million bucks you can stop that. 
Okay, this wouldn't happen in Europe, so I would say this is the good message about the European Union, they're doing a good job, but it is not for granted, like Sylvia said, because the car makers playing hard. They play dirty hockey, so it's really on, 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 a, on a tough level. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Aaron? So I agree with everything Frank and Sylvia said. Um, I mean, for... For all the money the car manufacturers spend, the, the car owners support the independent aftermarket. They want an independent aftermarket. Our industry is on the right side of this issue, competition. They know they benefit from having that choice. But as Frank said, the manufacturers are playing hardball. They see the dollar signs with control of the vehicle, and they've they gave that away years ago in the United States, but now they want it back. And they see this control of data to be one way to do that. Um, I'm optimistic. Our industry has faced technological and, and, and battles in the past, and we've always come out ahead. Um, but, you know, we, we ha as an industry, ignorance is not an excuse. We can't hide. We have to, people in the industry really need to be watching what's going on. The other thing I'll bring up is we are facing a technological tsunami coming down the road. You have electric vehicles, you have autonomous features. Training is going to be critical for our industry to stay competitive, to be part of the equation. If we're not training the you know, we could make tools and information available forever if we don't have people in the field that are making sure they're using it and understanding how these cars work, we're going to be in big trouble. And I, and I hate seeing, you know, in the U.S. I see this all the time. I talk to shops and they say, oh, you know, for that, I'm just sending it back to the dealer. I don't want to deal with that anymore. We can't, that cannot be a, uh, a scenario that's going to be sustainable for our industry in the long term. We need to be working with this technology and getting a grip on it. Otherwise, I think we are going to face problems. So I'm optimistic, and I think as an industry, we have great people that have worked hard to, to keep us competitive. But it, you know, this industry is going to have to also make some huge investments in the future to stay ahead of all the technology coming down the road. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, uh, and I've got to agree uh, with my three fellow panellists. We, as an industry collectively, are in the fight of our lives uh, for um, control of, of uh, the opportunity to, to compete on a level playing field, and, and technology is driving that, and, and the technology is, is moving so quickly. Um, but like Aaron, I'm, I'm also an optimist. Um, I can't imagine a world uh, where the OEMs control everything. You could just imagine how much it would cost to, to run a car, to repair a car, and, and, and so on. And at the end of the day, this is, whilst we represent you as, as the industry, this is a consumer issue. You know? Cars are uh, critical for, for mobility, uh, for, for consumers, and, and the cost of car ownership and maintenance is, is, a, is a critical part of every household budget everywhere in the world. Uh, so at the end of the day, our, 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 um, our regulators and our governments need to make sure that, there's a, that there is competition out there to, to, to keep that innovation going, but to keep the, the cost of car ownership down and, and uh, the levels of um, uh, service and, and um, competition up. So we need to really leverage that, but we need to address um, the, the technological issues, and I agree. Uh, training is a huge part of this. Our workshops need to have the, the latest training, the latest equipment. They're not going to be able to do everything, so they're probably going to have to specialise in more things. But So the, the nature and structure of the industry will change, but I'm very, very optimistic because we, we've addressed so many technological challenges before that we, we will overcome this, uh, but we need to do it collaboratively. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. I think that the consideration, the messages you share with us today are very important because they make us understood how difficult will be the fight. So I don't know if we have any question or if we have time for any question for the public. One question. Hello, the Massimo Brunamonti of ICA. Um, I heard you guys talking about uh, um, uh, free competition and uh, threat for that. And uh, uh, it, 
seems to be right because uh, uh, legislators found necessary to protect free competition through legislative devices everywhere, in Europe, United States, um, Australia. But on the other hand, are people claiming that we have cyber security related problems? So this means that my car can be hacked. So it becomes dangerous immediately. So are cyber security and competition so inconciliable? Or is that because, as Frank put it, the dashboard is a money-making machine of the future and somebody wants to put its hand on that only? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bruno Monti, for the question. Who wants to start first? Aaron. Thanks, Massimo, for that question. Does he really get to ask questions? <laughs> Um, you know, we, we are working in the United States and we've worked globally on developing cyber secure ways that data can be shared. Um, you know, we, we do everything these days. We do banking online, we do so many transactions online that are protected by cybersecurity using certificates. There's ways that this can be done. Um, the, you know, I've always found that automotive engineers when given a task, can find a way to do something. And we've worked you know, with engineers to develop international standards for data to be shared cybersecurely. The problem, I don't believe, is at the technical level. I believe that the problem is at the upper executive level, is that they just don't want to find a way to make data cybersecurely uh, available. Because we've shown it can be done. We've done demonstrations at our show in Las Vegas, Apex. We, we have done a, you know, work with a lot of global engineers to make this happen, and I, I think, Ultimately, we, we, can, we can do this, and we've already shown that it can be done. So my, my feeling is that whilst we have to show it, we have to demonstrate it, but it should not be an impediment to uh, data being shared in a competitive way with, uh, with independent repair shops. Thank you, Adam. I take your for So we had these discussions also. I'm from Germany, as you hear, from Bavaria, and we had also um, events like this and there was a professor from computation engineering and they was asking who has stolen something in the Amazon shop one of you did you steal something from the Amazon shop nobody knows that you can steal something in Amazon shop so the idea behind this the fact is that the data are technically already protected from the car makers because this is from the engineering side, as Aaron said, it is already possible. So technology, from the technology side, the data are protected. And only the lawmakers may open up the data where we need to get to uh, uh, by, 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 by laws. Yeah? So because technically, we have already the factual situation that from the technical side, the data are already locked. We are to totally locked out from the data, and this is the fact. So even more, we need to find uh, a good solution uh, in the lawmaking process, uh, especially here for Europe in Brussels. Please, Silvia. It's also for my side. Again, I'm always, uh, my member asks, oh, what are you doing uh, the entire day there in Brussels? Uh, I'm always replying, I do my nails, um, and uh, yeah. So, no, but joke apart, we are, Truly, and that is why we are in the interface between indeed the the business and the and uh, politics. I'm uh, with you, Frank. Uh, technical solutions are existing. Having said that, our work is not only determined by Brussels, but already now by you by the United Nations in Geneva. We should not lose this out of sight because cybersecurity rules are coming nowadays from Geneva. As FIGIFA, we have been there. We have participated uh, in the elaboration of the cybersecurity rules, which have been transposed into uh, into uh, the European Union. And when some people say, "Oh, um, Brussels is not always democratic," I reply, "Then you have not never been in Geneva." The problem there is that, um, that indeed these rules were made ultimately without considering in detail the aftermarket. That is what we are doing now. We are catching up. 
And, uh, and that is what the legislators are looking at. And of course, I can imagine, but there's a lot of scaremongering, you can imagine, around, around, of course, you can't possibly let the independents touch a vehicle because then everything can be hacked. And of course, to make this clear, we do care about uh, security, safety, cybersecurity, no doubt about that. We have elaborated solutions here. But indeed, the wider picture, and we should not forget this, is worldwide, is global. That means decision makers are asking about industrial policy, asking about champions in the world, and the car manufacturers are the ones who paint themselves very often as the industrial champion, champions who need support, um, as opposed to very often our members, our operators who are SMEs, small and medium-sized companies, very often not so visible as the big car manufacturers. There are discussions about um, letting the GAFAs, the hyperscalers, Google, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, into the vehicle. The car manufacturers said, oh, if we open up the vehicle, then these independents bring the Googles and Apples into the vehicle. We started working on this and we found out that the car manufacturers themselves have already partnered with Google, Apple, Amazon, and not only for a few features, but um, partnerships going from partnerships with the interface into the, in the human machine interface up to partnerships going deeply into the operational system. Yeah? Stellantis, partnership with Amazon. We don't judge ourselves whether these partnerships are worthwhile or not uh, for the car manufacturers, but then they should not pinpoint to us here and say, oh, you can't possibly let, or sh let us or oblige us to share data with the independent operators uh, and, and use the fake argument that the GAFAs and hyperscalers get with us into the vehicle when they themselves have already let the vehicle, excuse me, the GAFAs into the vehicle. So you see, these are all the facets about, uh, uh, of the discussion and the facets about um, the whole range of arguments, about, uh, whole range of arguments which are dealt with in Brussels and to which we have to find solutions and answers. Thank you, Sylvia. Stuart, your final comment. And, and look, just a, a quick word, uh, just to, uh, I guess, um, demonstrate the, the issues that we are facing. You know, we had a government that was very, very pro aftermarket when they were developing our legislation, um, and they still stopped short of um, providing us access to, to telematics and, and connected or information uh, 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 transmitted wirelessly for the moment. They've left the door open. Um, and the reason they did it was because of cyber security and, and the fact that we um, weren't able to demonstrate that, that we had the systems in place to be able to securely manage and, and um, transfer that data. Um, having said that, uh, you know, we as an industry have, have confronted all the car industry arguments. Um, you know, we got told that uh, um, if you give data to technicians, they're untrained and they won't be able to um, uh, repair the vehicles safely. We even got told that technicians will steal vehicles if you give them um, uh, the, the data, uh, will steal intellectual property. Will, I mean, the, the list of um, arguments that the car industry used against the independent aftermarket go on and on and on. Um, this is just the next iteration of it. Uh, they, you know, as um, Sylvia said, that they, that they'll partner with whoever they like, whether it's Microsoft or Amazon or so on, and that's okay, but if we did that, then um, you know, we're doing something that's wrong and unsafe. Um, so I, I think it is, it's a word of warning and, we, and, and again we, we, we just have to tackle this one both with, with logical arguments and, and backed up by uh, the technology and, and I think precedent again is really important. No pressure Aaron, but if you could get that, um, uh, that uh, win that court case in Massachusetts that would really greatly help us. <laughs> thank you, thank you Stuart, thank you all for these final comments. So we are at the end of uh, our meeting. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is no more time available, even if there would be a lot of points that uh, will be discussed with, uh, with our, uh, our guest. So I earnestly thank you for your contribution, and uh, I ask the audience for a warm round of applause for each of you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I also thank the audience and uh, I hope you enjoyed this event and you appreciate the importance of the daily work that the independent association do on behalf of the interests of independent aftermarket. Thank you. Thank you a lot.